I'm looking at Bobby Fischer's candidates semi-final match against Bent Larson. Fischer had won the first four games and now we're going to look at game five. After that fourth game, Larson had taken a time out. He was suffering from high blood pressure. It's interesting, he continued with his tactics in the fifth game of not backing down, not trying to kind of play a calm game, maybe something solid. He's playing the Sicilian with Black again. And Fisher was very happy to repeat the opening from game three, which was a Sozin. This bishop c4 move was one of Fisher's favourite opening variations with white. Had tremendous experience with it. Funnily enough, Larson had actually beaten him in the interzonal tournament uh, with this variation, but uh, Fisher was playing slightly differently. Instead of casting on the queen side, he was castling king side. And if you haven't seen it already, game three went a6 in this position. You will find all the previous games in the Fisher playlist. Just click on the info tab up there. Um, and or a6 isn't a bad move, but uh, lost and got his variations mixed up and lost uh, horribly, actually. So here he plays queen c8, which does look quite an unusual move. This is basically the same idea as in game three, but without the inclusion of a6 and a4. So it means there's no weakness on the b6 square. So the idea is to put pressure on f5, discouraging f5 because of the lineup of queen and bishop. Um, but I have to say there's something that looks so unnatural about the move. Um, I don't like the queen on c8 really. I mean, if white wants to, you could just play queen f3 here uh, and connect the rooks and, and white's position looks fine to me. But Fisher characteristically continued on with his plan. You know, he was a very straightforward player, didn't compromise. So this is basically ignoring the fact that black has enough firepower on f5 and just getting on with it. So Larson takes this pawn, but you can see that both white's bishops look absolutely tremendous here. Um, now, Fisher did not take on f5. If you take on f5, then the bishop captures and can sit pretty happily on g6, covering that all-important f7 square and covering the king as well. No, that wasn't Fisher's idea. He just gave this pawn, just brought the queen up to protect e4, and now his rooks are connected. So, classic Fisher, playing very simply, but... There's tremendous harmony in his position. Look at all white's pieces are in play. Just compare it with black's pieces here. You know, I, I just don't like that queen on c8, which splits black's rooks. But Larson is a pawn up, so let's see how things developed. Larson exchanging pieces, that's very wise, and then playing bishop e6 to exchange off that dangerous light squared bishop on b3 there was pressure down on f oops whoops pressure down on f7 good move from fisher rook f3 now that rook has the possibility to swing in to to the king side to the queen side very nice and prepares to bring rook number 2 in as well Queen c6, so Fisher also, uh, excuse me, Larson also playing very responsibly here. When your opponent has active pieces, you want to try and trade them off. So queen c6 makes a lot of sense here, and he's a pawn up. But Fisher just brings that rook over, allowing an exchange of queens, maintaining pressure on the bishop here. So if bishop takes bishop, then rook takes that rook swinging across, threatening the b-pawn, and the bishop threatened as well. So 
well, if white recovers his pawn here, then he'll have a really active position and beautiful pawn structure. So no, that's not what happened. Having exchanged queens, Larsen plays d5. So the bishop is now secure, and for a little moment, just shuts that bishop on b3 out of the game. But, well, the tactics aren't over yet. Uh, Fischer is still using his active pieces. He played rook g3, threatening rook takes g7. So if, well, if pawn takes rook, let's just have a quick look at this, then, in fact, this is completely disastrous. Um, that's will very soon be checkmate, actually. Okay, let's go back. So rook g3, g6, stopping rook takes g7, and tactics aren't over. Bishop takes d5. Now, this was a critical moment in the game, and I think this really shows Larson's character here. He is not one to back down. He's he just he's afraid of no one on the chessboard and wanted to strike back. He wanted to give himself a chance to win this game. If he'd wanted to just keep things calm and perhaps try to steer the game towards a draw, then he could have taken this bishop. Let's bring this rook across, attack that pawn. And let's play b6. Now, you could say that white is a little bit better here. This bishop is a little bit annoying, looking at those dark squares. The rook is on the 7th. However, with opposite colour bishops, and this bishop able to lock itself on e6, preventing this rook coming in, then it should be possible to exchange off that rook. And it will be hard for white to make anything of that position. Now, perhaps Larson would have had to do a bit of defence there, find some accurate moves, but essentially I think that's the best way for Black to play. That's what Larson should do. He should try and make a draw. But no, that's not his character. He played bishop d6, and the tactics keep going here. So attacking the rook and also threatening to take here. But this gave Fischer the chance to sacrifice an exchange. Now obviously pawn takes rook will be met by bishop takes and those two bishops are too strong. Black has to give back a rook and white would be a pawn up. But bishop takes rook. So then rook e7. So Fischer has sacrificed the exchange. And Larson was obviously hoping that perhaps if things went wrong for White, he could still maybe um, win this one. He wants to give himself some hope at least. But in fact, Fisher's bishops here are too strong. And in connection with that rook on the seventh, this is fantastic for White, fantastic compensation. Larson played rook c8 here. He said after the game he thought a5 was a better move, but this is still really tough for black. One of the reasons is that it's not possible to exchange off the active rook. Let me just, just demonstrate that. So, for example, if rook b8. Now, if black could exchange off rooks, then he would have some hope. But let's keep an active rook. Rook here. And if rook d8, here's the point that white doesn't have to go back, but you can play bishop takes pawn check. And after rook takes bishop, rook takes rook. Well, white just has uh, two extra pawns there with a completely winning position. So black would still be in trouble after a5, in fact. Now Larson played rook c8, c5, a5, and rook a7. That look, rook looking good on a7. You can see there's pressure on f7. Not possible to drive it away with rook a8 because of the bishop. 
and white just has a dominating position here. Another problem for black, you really want to trade one of those bishops off the board and you can do that with bishop c5 but after this exchange then the king just marches up into the middle and black is always tied to f7. The king will come to d4, force the rook away and then the c pawn advances. This is a winning position for white. And I think this, the situation is now hopeless for Larson actually. Well, with some decent technique. He played bishop c7 to try and block out the rook. g3, very calmly played from Fischer. And after rook e8, the king just stepped across to prevent that rook entering into white's position. So you can see all these entry squares are covered. So fine technique from Fischer. Very calm move, g3 just making sure he could move his, his king across without allowing the capture of the pawn here. Rook e7 from Larson. Bishop f6. So, I mean, that bishop looking fantastic here, and Larson could play rook d7. It looks miserable. Uh, I mean, after rook d7, it'll be possible just to, to bring... The, the king into the middle um, and support the advance of the pawns on the queen side. Um, Fish are doing some great work here with the, with the pin. Rook e3 played instead, so trying to keep that rook boxed in on the king side. But now bishop c3. And here's a great move from Fischer. Doesn't, doesn't capture this yet. Rook a6. He just keeps Larson completely bottled up. This is a great move. So threatening rook takes g6. Check. Exploiting the pin here. But also threatening rook c6. Keeping black tied up with another pin. It's another pin and win situation. Bishop e5 looks as though Larson is maybe doing something, you know, exchanging off bishops, but no, Fischer has it all worked out because, in fact, now this rook is trapped. Secret of good technique is good calculation. Basically, all these lines work for Fischer because he's worked out that here Larson couldn't trade bishops because that rook is now trapped. And here's how it works. Rook here, king e2. Rook only has one square, and now the rook finds itself skewered here. Really nasty. So Larson gives back the exchange. And once again, we see that this is a case where Fisher handles exchanges and transitions beautifully. So again, this is down to pure calculation. Fisher has worked out that he can trade down into a winning endgame. Um, if bishop takes bishop, then rook e4 check, and you recapture here, but no. King d3, beautifully calculated. The rook has to step back to protect the bishop. Rook takes pawn, forcing an exchange of rooks. Material is now even, but way back, way back when Fischer first trapped that rook, he will have understood that he could transpose into this, trade down into this, and this is a completely winning endgame. The king is too far away, and Fischer can gain time by offering an exchange of bishops, the king point indeed is completely winning, as we'll see in a second. If bishop a3, then the pawn rolls home. a6, followed by bishop d4. So last and exchange bishops, and obviously this is completely winning. Brilliant technique from Fischer, absolutely brilliant. So 
So we just use that um, A pawn as a decoy, send black's king that way, and then we go the other way. So these were the final moves of the game, and the king is about to just chomp up all those pawns, and then the G pawn will roll home. Uh, great technique from Fisher. Uh, once again, you know, I think Larson basically misjudged the situation terribly um, at this moment. He should have steered the game towards a draw, but you know, always striving to to complicate, to, to put pressure on his opponent, but Fisher had this end game completely under control and his technique was brilliant. So that was 5-0 for Fisher in the match. Um, remember, if you're not a subscriber, do click on that button on the subscribe button below. And if you want to support the channel, then do click on the links to patreon.com powerplaychess. Or if you want to make a one-off donation, then PayPal as well. You'll find the links in the description down there. Thanks for watching.